Good afternoon. I hope you have your Bibles available, and if you do, open up to Ephesians chapter 4. Today we're going to see Paul, well, he might as well have been writing directly to us, the church of this day. He starts with this, verse and verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You know, if anyone had a right to speak his or her mind and his or her heart um, to the church at Ephesus, it would certainly be Paul. We know he began the church in his second missionary journey, and, to, and he, on his third missionary journey, he spent two and a half years there. And furthermore, he reminds them that he is a prisoner for the Lord. Why? Because he preached the gospel, as it says in Romans, to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. There was a church in Ephesus because he preached. And because he preached, he was a prisoner. He had the right to speak to the church. And he goes on and he says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Church, remember, Christ came to this earth, died a horrific death so that we might be saved. That salvation was an undeserving gift. So our life isn't ours to live. It is Christ. And so the life we do live, though, we live that life worthy of the price that was paid, worthy of the calling that we have been called to live. How do we do that? In verse 2, he says, we are to do with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. We are to live our life worthy of the price that was paid. How? Well, Paul says these attributes are attributes that we should hold dear, attributes that we should hold true, and attributes that we should faithfully live. And again, he names them humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, and unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That's easy to say, but harder to do, especially since, since the days of Adam and Eve Honestly, these are not natural attributes of mankind anymore. Look around. Do you see humility? I see pride. Gross, sinful pride. The Bible talks about the pride of the people who decided to, to build the tower, to reach God, the Tower of Babel. Um, that's nothing. We live in a day and an age where people, they think they are God. You want humility? Look to Christ. He was the definition of humility. My favorite probably was washing the very feet of the ones who should have been washing his feet. How about gentleness? Watch the news. I, I, I see roughness and anger. We talk about our cities, the destruction and killing, but it isn't just our, uh, our cities, it's society. People literally hating people. People angry at people. Look at Facebook. I used to um, I use personally use Facebook to just to encourage and to share my experience with the friends and family. It's now hateful. It's biased. It's full of lies and half-truths. Society is so hateful. It's not gentle. You know, what about Christ? I love the way he treated the woman who was going to be stoned. Go and sin no more. How about the gentleness of the way he treated the Samaritan woman at the well? Patience? Don't get me started with patience. Well, maybe instead of pointing fingers, uh, maybe I could admit I struggle with patience. I, I want it, but I don't have the patience to get patience. You know what I mean? Um, Christ lived a perfect life. A perfect life surrounded by so much imperfection. Now that, to me, is such a wonderful definition of patience. Then it goes on to say, how about bearing with one another in love? The key is bearing with one another in love. 
Yeah, I see a lot of love. We love me, myself, and I. That's society. Christ loved others so much that he died for us. And here's one. The unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Can we count how many things are wrong in today's society with this one statement? There is no unity, nor is there peace. Perhaps we are in the worst of times when it comes to unity and peace. It's so scary, the lack of unity and peace. It's destroying our cities. It's destroying our homes. It's destroying our families. But Paul goes on in verse 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended... What does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of deceit, doctrine, human cunning by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. There is that part of me that wants to spend time. I love, you know, spending time on the things like the meaning of the ascended, led a host of captives, the descended. But honestly, this section is, is so much less about that and so much more about what God desires for us and the church. These verses are, are first and foremost less about us as individuals. And it is much more about the body of Christ. Here's one problem I see since March. I see a church they spent too much time in isolation. Yeah, we listened and we watched church and, and other Christians. But when you read these verses, Christ wants a living church, a united church, a ministering church. It's not about me alone in isolation. He wants an us thing. He wants one body working, meeting together. And that's why he says that, he, that, that we were given apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. He gave us people, churches. Again, he didn't, it's not about me. It's about the entirety of the church, the collective nature of us building together a body of Christ. It says to equip us for the work laid out for us to build us to be more like Christ, to make us more united in faith and full of knowledge, to make us more mature in doctrine, to make us collectively the church, the church Christ wants us to be. It can't happen alone in your bed. It can't happen alone in isolation. It's about us. It's about us it is about us. Verse 17 says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have been have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have 
heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Wow. You know, Paul is so describing our society. Listen to these words, futile minds, darkened in understanding, alienated from the life of God, ignorant, hearts hardened, callous, given to sensuality, greed, and impurity. The question for us is this, why are things so bad? I think we, in our heart, our hearts, we as Christians, we know why. Look at society. We remove God from law and society. We have minimized life through abortion and euthanasia. We have placed man above the law and authority. We have honored ourselves above our brothers. We have destroyed the home unit. We have separated God from education. We have created a sterile, godless society. We have elevated those who entertain us over those who truly help us. We have defined relationships through the physical and not the spiritual. We have decided that it is our time and not God's time, God's time that has been given to us. We have held back our tithe and spent it on ourselves. You know I could go on, but until we as individuals put the Lord first, we collectively must unite as a church and as a society become as a society become a nation under God. If we do not become that nation under God again, things will continue to decay and get worse. 25 says, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do and give no opportunities to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give peace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So Ephesians 4 closes with a few things that can still happen, must still happen. It says if we begin to change our hearts and lives, if we recognize that we as a church must in Christ do the following, put away falsehood, speak spiritual truth with our neighbors, be angry but sin not. Do not let the sun go down on her anger, especially if you're living in Alaska since you have like 80 days of sunshine. You got to learn to let go and let God give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but to do honest work so the thief can then share what he has earned. Let no corrupt talk come from our mouths, only that which is good for edifying and giving grace. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Put away bitterness, wrath, anger, slander, and malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving as we were forgiven. Church, you know that we can only do these things through Christ, which strengthens us. It must be Christ. Christ in us, Christ in our churches, and then once it is in us, once it is in our churches, we then, it is our responsibility to pass it on to our society. 
because society without Christ will continue to decay and even worse in society without the church's input and influence will self-destruct. Choice is easy. We sit back, continue to watch the world decay and die while we wait patiently for the rapture to occur or we live for Christ, which means we got to do this church. We got to stand up, unite for the church, speak out. We got to vote. We got to demand change. We got to take back our schools. We got to save the family unit. We got to show that love builds and hate destroys. We got to share that Christ loved all and died for all. We got to live as examples. We got to teach our young in the way they should go. Let the world see the Bible is more true and necessary today than at any other time. Show that politics can't change a thing. Only hearts can. Only love, agape love, Christ love can change. Let us win the world. Let's pray. Lord, we are watching a decaying and dying world around us. It can't be enforced, enforced through laws, through Facebook, social media, um, the press. Lord, there's only one answer for the world, and that's us, the church. And Lord, I just pray that we will understand that, that God, you don't want us to sit back and patiently wait for the rapture to occur. Lord, you want us to get busy for you. We are yours. We've been paid for by, by, by an unbelievable price. Our time, our life is not our own. It's yours. 24 hours a day, seven days a week is your time. Lord, let us get busy and go out and to, and to share and to preach and to win this world to you. That is the only hope our society has. But Lord, we can also do those things. We can get involved in our society. Lord, we can just get involved and, and, and run for town offices and run for, for state and national offices. We can, we can vote as a block of unit, the church block, seeking your face, seeking your ways. Lord, if we do, Lord, I believe that you have plans and purpose, Lord, for a revival to still occur in this land. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for what you desire to do. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. All God's people say, amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining in.